All right, whenever Good morning. you guys are ready. How are you? We'll start. Everybody well? Animated? Excited? Um, my name is Paul Dervazi, and I'm a high school English and media studies teacher at Royal St. George's College in Toronto, Canada. And this is my esteemed colleague and friend, uh, John Fallon, who is also an English teacher in Fairfield, Connecticut, at the Fairfield Country Day School, and he also teaches English uh, to middle school students. Um, so John and I met at this conference uh, two years ago. Uh, I had shown up with this really weird game, and, and I thought there's nobody on the face of this planet who will have anything like this. And to my horror and amusement, uh, I looked on a last minute addition to the schedule and sure enough, somebody, <laughs> this guy, had come up with a similar game uh, at a similar school in another country. And, and I was thinking, well, I should really meet this guy. But serendipity brought us together because as I was lining up for the shuttle bus to take us to our first day of the conference, I'm standing beside this guy wearing sunglasses in line and we start chatting and sure enough, it's my friend John Fallon. And I think that this relationship could have gone two ways. We would have become bitter enemies, uh, challenging each other with trying to one-up each other with our games or collaborate and become friends. And thankfully that's the route that we took. So what we're going to be discussing today are alternate reality games and how you might think about incorporating alternate reality games into your classroom. And um, we're going to look at very briefly the games that John and I designed independently of each other, culminating into an alternate reality game called Blind Protocol that we co-designed and delivered at both of our schools at the same time that allowed our schools to engage with each other. So I'll start by letting John explain a little bit about what alternate reality games are. So alternate reality games occupy a very niche corner of the game world. I would say even very experienced gamers in this room might uh, have not even played one or maybe not even ever heard of it. It's a very um, you know, small but passionate corner of the game world. Uh, but what is an alternate reality game? I would say very simply it's an interactive network narrative that uses the real world as its platform. So unlike a, a board game, which uses the physical space on the tabletop as its play space, or a video game, which uses the virtual world on the screen as its play space, an alternate reality game exists wherever uh, the players are interacting. That includes in the real world, in the digital world, in their email, in their uh, social media, uh, on you know mysterious park benches with envelopes taped underneath them. Anywhere players are existing and communicating, the alternate reality game can and does show up, and that is where you play the game. And uh, this uh, ability for it to exist everywhere allows our alternate reality games to blur the line between fiction and reality, and that is very much actually what makes alternate reality games unique and fun, is that blurring of fiction and reality, not being quite sure where the game and the, the real world uh, you know, kind of stop colliding. And that, that's a lot of the fun. And because the central ethos of the alternate reality game is often this is not a game. And it's the fun of, of, of pretending, especially from the game designer's perspective, oftentimes never acknowledging that a game is being played and letting the players uh, kind of uh, fight their way through and, and explore and discover the game and the narrative as they go within the real world. So as I said, it occupies the digital space, websites, apps, uh, social media, all types of digital communications. But then it also can very quickly and suddenly transcend into the physical, mysterious signs on uh, telephone poles near, near the school, uh, or even the, the public uh, communication uh, um, environments uh, all around the school, like a, like a school newsletter or, or, the, or the school communication network. So my journey into alternate reality games uh, started three years ago when I wanted to find a way to um, augment my instruction of Homer's Odyssey. It's a book that's been taught for thousands of years and has appeared everywhere. And there is something universal and, and, and eternal about it, but I wanted to do better than just saying, hey, isn't this great and isn't it cool how so many of our stories uh, copy this model? And I was like, how can I bring this into the 21st century? And Alternate reality games were that vehicle because I don't have any programming or coding experience. I am not a professional game designer. If you sat me down and told me, you know, write 
HTML code, I break out in a cold sweat. But alternate <laughs> reality games are this nice little shortcut which allows you to create very immersive game experiences without any of that knowledge. Just very basic design knowledge, like making a, a very basic website or crafting an email. That's really the bar that we're talking about here. So I'll give you an example of a few elements of, of the Dolus game to give you an idea of how an alternate reality game works and how an alternate reality game in a classroom works. So all alternate reality games start by going down the rabbit hole. The rabbit hole is, you know, referencing Alice in Wonderland, is that moment where the game world becomes the real world, and the real world becomes the game world, and it becomes uh, kind of fun and not being able to tell the difference between the two. Here's where Dolo starts, with a BBC World News article. However, this is not a real BBC World News article, but it does appear to be a BBC World News article. And it begins on the first day of us studying the Odyssey, and I hand it out to the boys, and I say, oh, let's get into reading groups, let's uh, read this very interesting article that happened to pop up on, on today's day, um, and let's answer some discussion questions, get to work. And then I then walk around and basically you know, just pretend to be supervising them. Because as they go through this article, it starts off dramatically. A uh, mysterious thief has stolen a priceless artifact that purports to be the real journal of Odysseus. Um, but there are a few things that are quite odd and different. Dr. Henry Jones III is the archaeologist who has discovered this artifact. Uh, a detail uh, referencing, referencing Indiana Jones that a few of the guys uh, maybe pick up on, maybe don't, at least not right away. Um, you know, April O'Neill is the reporter who has penned the article. He's the reporter from Ninja Turtles. Um, all sorts of things that are not quite making sense in this otherwise realistic uh, piece of uh, realistic document. And then the riddle that the mysterious thief has left on top of the of the trunk that he stole it from directly references my students and kind of breaks the fourth wall in a very direct way. And they go, "Whoa, something's not right here." And as they figure out this riddle. They are approached by Dolus uh, through, an, through email because he has hacked the school servers and he has his own email address. Um, and he challenges them to get the, the pages of the journal back page by page. You know, he has kind of this riddler persona. He's very obsessed with his own ego and his own cleverness and he challenges them uh, to figure out his puzzles. So here is uh, an example of how the, the, the puzzles can jump back and forth uh, in the classroom. So they get this puzzle. Uh, at a certain point in the game. And has this uh, mysterious uh, symbol that a few of them recognize as a Freemason symbol. Uh, and it tells them that it should look familiar because you've seen it every day. And they immediately kind of get confused and they scratch their head and they wander around school. Is there like a plaque or a painting that I haven't noticed before? Um, and, and, and several days will go by. This game is, is designed to make them have to sweat over a long period of time. There are no instant answers here. Um, and very much designed to be that way. And then they're in history class, and they are, I'm sure, only rarely as they ever do, their attention begins to wander. And they look at the lapel pin on their history teacher. And he has been wearing this every single day, and they've probably never noticed it. <laughs> and they see that, and they freak out. <laughs> they then accost the history teacher at the end of class, Shouting at him, give me the next clue Dolo sent me, and he simply shrugs his shoulder and goes, I have no idea what you're talking about, get to class. And I, I have no idea what they're talking about. If you're pursuing a thief, you should probably leave it to the police, and, which they, of course, ignore. Um, and they are working their way uh, through these puzzles. But they return back to the clue. And it tells them that horse feathers is going to help this person help them. And they have no idea what horse feathers is. One industrious uh, student took the, uh, the, the thesaurus and then uh, yelled every synonym for horse feathers, balderdash, uh, jabberwocky, all types of things with this teacher, and of course, the no avail. But once you went to Google and you started figuring out what horse feathers might mean, you're eventually going to find yourself on the uh, Wikipedia page for the famous Marx Brothers movie. And there's a famous scene in this uh, famous movie with a very famous password that is swordfish. Take the word swordfish to the history teacher, and all of a sudden, he shuts the door, he closes the blinds, and he goes, where did you hear that word? <laughs> <laughs> and he gives them a challenge. They work their way through these challenges. They are able to then decode the gobbledygook on the clue that was uh, heretofore unreadable, and it decodes into the final phase of this puzzle where it asks them to find the Treaty of Tripoli and Wounded Knee and grade side by side. 
There's not that many places on campus that are engraved. There's not that many places on campus that have the word corner in their name. And sure enough, when they eventually do some research and some wandering around and some puzzling, they find themselves at the cornerstone of the school where there's a stone that appears to be not quite what it seems. And sure enough, within the stone is the next part of the game. So hopefully this is an example of how an alternate reality game puzzle works and they're jumping back and forth between the digital, how the space around them has been repurposed for the game. All of it fits into the narrative in its own kind of wacky way. So I designed Dolus because I wanted to my, my students to externalize what I thought was Odysseus's heroic qualities, problem solving, tenacity, the ability to be in an impossible situation that has no way out but it does if you look hard enough and you work hard enough. You know, escaping the, uh, the Cyclops' cave. Uh, you know, finding a way to get back home to Troy. And I wanted them to have to actually fight their way through puzzles in that same exact way. But this was a lightweight parallel part of the unit. It was, it's actually extra credit in its current form. Uh, but I would say about 50 to 75% of them participate all the way through. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's a nice kind of side vehicle. However, it can scale up. And Paul has done exactly that with his war game unit that he does with his students. Thanks, John. Uh, so I have the thankless job of teaching the only mandatory class in grade 12, which is English, right? So I have lots of reluctant participants in my class. And things become particularly dire in the last month of school because this is senioritis in full swing. These guys have been accepted to college. They, they stop working. The hygiene levels plummet. Sweats start showing up in class. I mean, it's, it's a disastrous time of year, and I've taught grade 12 enough to expect this coming. And then I, I changed the curriculum a bit, and I introduced One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. And I absolutely love this book on many different levels for many different reasons, and I highly suggest you read it. And I just couldn't let it go. I couldn't just say, okay, let, I'm just going to plow through it. We're all going to pretend they're doing the work. They're going to graduate, and off they go. So I spent a couple of sleepless nights mulling over what I could do, and I thought about the book, and I thought about the fact here we have all these prisoners who are in, in, in an institution, uh, they're, they're being you know, guided by a very, you know, authority figures, uh, they're following the rules of the clock on a daily basis, and if things aren't going too well, we drug them. And I thought, wow, it's school. The <laughs> asylum and the school are almost exactly the same. And I, I teach uh, all boys, so the, the characters and the, the, the patients in the novel were all boys, so it was a perfect alignment. I thought, what if I create a game to externalize One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? I'll take on the role of an authoritarian nurse. They will be my patients. I'll instill this regime for 30 days and try to follow the narrative to the best of my ability. And what ensued, and now I've I played it three times, is the ward game, which is what I always play in the last 30 days of my English class. This is a video that was made by two of my best filmmaking students. They actually weren't in the same year. One guy cut a lot of the, filmed a lot of it, another guy actually edited it. Uh, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but I think it'll give you a bit of the emotional sense of the game, and you get to see me once again dressed as a nurse. just covering one of his classes. I knew very little. I asked for the coverage so that I wear a lab coat, a name tag, 
and um, did not know the voice. I did not know the voice. <laughs> Phrase that follows was simultaneously transmitted across three narrative speakers or frames. Who are they? There is generally one person in every situation we must never underestimate the power of. Send the correct answer to the big nurse for the next clue. It was kind of scary, actually. Um, you know, we didn't know what to trust. Like this one little project that's like made people lie and scheme. Make people lie and scheme. This is what you want. Um, so uh, we have. Uh, Three things to report uh, in, in the end. It's, all, it's way too complicated to explain, but it worked really well. One, my students produced more work and better quality work at a time when they typically did nothing, right? So that it, it, the engagement thing definitely worked with most of them. It's never all of them, but with most of them. Uh, the second thing was, and this is the best part, and this is where I get all weepy and emotional, but I won't this time, is that my lowest performing students, the guys who sit at the back of the class doing absolutely nothing because they hate school, with good reason, they hate school, all of a sudden came to life and did so much they couldn't stop. They, they, and I know guys that won the game a week in advance and wanted to play more and, the, and do more, and these are guys that had done nothing. And what it teaches me, what it shows me clearly, never mind games, you change the system, you harness a different type of learner and a different type of mind. We give them one system, one option, that's it. If your mind works with that system, great. If it doesn't, too bad, you're out of luck, right? And we are losing very smart people as a result of that and crushing souls in the process. Um, so John and I then, uh, after we'd met, decided that, you know, we started talking and an idea started germinating. We think, oh, why don't we design a game together between our schools and connect our schools? And John and I share a passion for uh, privacy, surveillance, and online security. Particularly, we feel it is something that has to be taught in schools and is not taught in schools. Our kids are online all the time and they're absolutely clueless as to the kind of data that they're, that they're giving up, how they're being watched, what information's being taken from them. We're putting them out into this world utterly defenseless. So we decided to create a game, an alternate reality game, between our schools that would instruct on privacy, surveillance, online security, which is really a fundamental point of digital citizenship. And it's ultimately about digital citizenship. So this is the love child of Dolus and the Ward game. They kind of came together and made this little baby called Blind Protocol. Now, what Blind Protocol is about, uh, or the, the general storyline is, Horus is an artificial intelligence that was being experimented with by the military. And it has gone rogue. It has, it has become sentient. And what it is doing is, in order to become more masterful and powerful, it is setting up all kinds of bizarre social experiments using network uh, communication to see how humans react to various different situations. So it gathers more information about humans and it becomes more sentient and more able to control them. Well, in this particular story, he decides that he is going to create mock cyber warfare between two groups of students to see how students react or how people react in these types of situations. So when the game starts, neither of our schools knew about the existence of the other school. They had no idea that there was another school involved in this project. They thought they were the only ones that Horace was dealing with. But late in the game, they realize they have opponents, and the point of the game 
is uncovering their location and their identity. Can you figure out where the other team is in this world? And that's the basic premise of it. So we're going to go into details to, as to how that played out. Pass it over to my dear friend, John. The rabbit hole began the other day. Uh, Paul and I had aligned our calendars that we were both finishing and beginning to submit on the same day at the same time. And I began to submit like I normally would. What does cybersecurity mean to you? you know, what do you think about when you think about online security? Now, do you know who Edward Snowden is? Pepper Jack, that thing. Uh, and they knew about these kinds of issues, but they admitted that they were fairly ignorant, which I thought was a good starting point what I, what I predicted. And then uh, I said, we're going to watch a TED Talk with a cybersecurity expert uh, who's going to kind of explain some of the basics of this issue. However, the TED Talk is not what it appears to be. Uh, and uh, as the rabbit hole began, uh, it transitioned to what's probably the most shocking thing that can ever happen uh, in the classroom in terms of a teacher enters their phone. We're entering the age where we talk about cyber weapons. In fact, uh, uh, do you know that? Hello? Yeah, understood. And then I pack my bag and I leave. And as you can see, um, all over in Toronto, he packs his bag and he leaves. And we did not return. And we left the two completely. With a completely unexplainable situation. Now, before we move on uh, to the next thing, the graph will stop and uh, point out that I really uh, noticed when I was reading the footage. So, as you can see, we set up cameras under the guise of professional development uh, to you know, keep your own practices. So, we really just set up this you know, uh, mood of, of surveillance and get uh, footage of the project. Uh, and as I was reviewing the tape, I noticed something. I want you to look at this student. We'll call him Nigel. Nigel is uh, in the kind of the standard uh, mode of most students. He's got his hand uh, on his head. He's uh, not completely, but he's maybe about 50%, 75% at best. Um, and watch what happens to Nigel uh, the moment that I left the room. <laughs> <laughs> shock and wonder that really actually is too genuine. But we forget students are very good at getting into the routine because we've been training them to get into the routine for about, at this point, 10 years. And this is what happens when you rupture that routine, when you break it, when you step away from it. And it's very powerful. But back to the rabbit hole. So they had to figure out what the hell is going on. That is my opinion. Yeah, I can't. The test is the CLJ pod. I swear. Okay, I'm going to say it. This is great. Please. Yo, tell us. Sit down. Hold on. 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 Hold uh, once they open up that email, Horace makes his first contact. Greetings, Apolite. We are Horace. You have never met us, and you never will. We, of course, know exactly who you are. We know everything about you. We know where you were born. We know where you live. We know your favorite websites. We know your financial information, your math grade, and we know all your online aliases. We are everywhere, and we have been watching you. We are watching you right now. We have eyes and ears in every corner of the planet. We have assessed your data and have determined your profile to be ideal for our purposes. So, Morrison goes on to indoctrinate them into the program. The program is his uh, social experiment for his 
own uh, mysterious and nefarious purposes. And the program is broken uh, up into four phases over 30 days uh, that Paul and I are running uh, simultaneously. The acolyte phase, the analyst phase, the architect phase, and the operative phase. Uh, and each uh, one of these phases uh, has its own specific goals uh, and expectations that the, that the boys are working through to be able to extend to the next one. Each phase is also gated by a very um, a robust puzzle uh, experience that they have to navigate through, in addition to whatever requirements are needed for that rank. So the first rank, uh, the acolyte phase, uh, uses an uh, Egyptian mythology team that existed throughout the entire program uh, to immediately get them uh, focusing on critical thinking and collaboration. And what that requires them to do is they have to solve four different but related riddles that they then broken up into groups and then not only solve those individual riddles but then find a way to consolidate and synthesize all of their results to then solve a final riddle to find a data cache in somewhere called the sarcophagus. And then once they had done that, they also then had to create their own uh, anonymous identities within the program. So here's how uh, it worked. They had to find four canopic jars, known as the Sons of Horus, uh, that Horus wanted them to collect. And each one of the groups got an email that looked like this. And in addition to explaining what they had to do, it also had this series of ones and zeros at the bottom of the email. They just quickly figured out that was binary code and ran it through a binary code translator, which then left them with the clue for that canopic jar. In this case, for at my school, it was the only mother of crusaders looks to the answer. Now, our school mascot is the crusaders. So they know they're, they're, they're honed in on this is something local, something nearby. Where is this canopic jar? So they began thinking about this, exploring the school, working on their own. Again, I'm not helping them. As, as, as uh, the conduit of Horus, I'm just giving some instructions. And uh, they took around the school, and then they remembered. Conference room. There's portraits of all the previous headmasters and the one headmistress. You look to where Mrs. Ely is kindly looking, and she is looking for the answer. You follow her gaze, and sure enough, there's the canopic jar. And they had to do this for another three other uh, riddles, all throughout the uh, different parts of the school, at the cardinal points of north, north, south, east, and west that all of the canopic jars are associated with, in addition to a, a major organ. The monks of nation purpose. And once they've got all four of them, they have to then start figuring out okay, how does this real work? What are the different parts? Because uh, they basically have a, a gobbledygook phrase, they don't know what the correct order is. So they began experimenting. Now, there's a couple things uh, to watch while, while this is happening. First, this is a student's idea to create the time lapse video, which I thought was fantastic. Um, I am a passive and silent observer to this process. They are completely guiding their own. Problem solving and collaborate, uh, collaborative process. They're sending guys out to test ideas, they're coming back and reporting what they found. They're then reworking what they thought was working before because it's no longer working. All of this on their own, all of this completely unguided by me. And uh, sure enough, shortly after this video was taken, they went and they sat down to lunch, and one of the students was sitting at table 10, and he looked underneath and found the sarcophagus. And in that data cache of the sarcophagus, they then uh, were given instructions of how to move on to the second rank. One of which was creating their own asset profile, which had their own anonymous identity within the program that they can only refer to each other as the code name. Uh, and this also became very important later in the game when they were given third parties. Uh, but once they uh, uh, finished this, they could move on to the next rank. Now what this did, uh, as I said, it created a sense of immediate collaboration and immediate problem solving. scripted on their own. They're figuring it out. I'm just thinking about it and watching it happen. But not only did it create the spirit of collaboration, but perhaps more importantly, it created a deep sense of complete paranoia. <laughs> 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 and once that deep sense of paranoia was established, they can move on. I'll tell you more about the second rank. So they ascend then to rank two, which is the analyst phase, where we want to focus on research and developing research skills. So one thing John and I dreamed up is something called a data fort, because it sounds really cool, and they should each have a data fort. So what a data fort was is we gave them specs in that, in that uh, sarcophagus catch. We gave them specs to gather 
uh, 80 to 100 resources, research resources, which we called info units within the game from 20 different sources. So these could be uh, websites, uh, uh, scholarly journal articles, newspaper articles. It was almost a treasure hunt for all of this information, all related to privacy, surveillance, and cyber warfare. Uh, and we, we gave the specs, and then they had to gather all of this information in the data fort. And what we used is an online service called Digo, which allows you to catalog information and tag it. And we thought this would be a really great way for them to, to have all of this stuff gathered in a single place for later use. And I'll explain why they used it later. Well, this did not work out so well. And the next time we run this game, we're going to change this. And I'll tell you why. First of all, when John and I were experimenting with Digo, we only threw a couple things in, tested to see how it worked. Well, when you get beyond a certain amount of information, they charge you, right? So we hadn't anticipated that. And all of a sudden, kids are saying, sure, they want my credit card. I'm like, OK, you know, uh, hold off on that. So our kids very resourcefully, both without having any communication with each other, moved to Google Docs and started compiling all the information on Google Docs. But the other thing is, is that we kind of dreamed up this idea where they'd have this reservoir of information and they would draw, they'd have all the information that they need to draw on for the third phase, which they, they develop artifacts based on this information. But this is not how our students conduct research. It's so much easier to go to Google and put in your subject and get the information back. So this was an artificial way to try to get them to, to put this research. And I think the research part is really important. We just have to figure out a way to make it uh, more fluid with the way that they naturally research. And the big lesson here is, is that when you try these things out, nothing, well, some things don't work out the way you think they will. And that's the process of iteration. You will fail. Not everything will work out that well. There are things that are not perfect. And you'll also be surprised on the other end of the scale, some insignificant little thing that you didn't think would be a big deal ends up being a huge success. But the stuff in theory doesn't always play out in practice. And the beauty of putting these things into play is you start learning about what works and what doesn't work, and you make adjustments accordingly. And the students are really forgiving because they know that you're putting yourself out there. And they know that you're doing something completely different. And they know it's not that easy. They're really smart. Kids are smart. They appreciate it. And they will forgive your mistakes and work with you. OK, the other thing that was introduced during the rank two phase was the feed. And the feed is Horace has hijacked a Twitter account and turned it into his personal communication channel. So what the feed shows are things like um, articles that are related to privacy and surveillance come up on the feed. Uh, missions will sometimes come up on the feed. Um, and later in the game, when they started engaging each other, he would keep updates as to what was going on as the students in the two schools were engaging each other. And the students were discouraged from following the feed because if they followed them, their Twitter account might provide a clue as to their location later in the game. So you see that uh, poor Horace has no followers. OK. Um, then this, once they, they completed the data, ba the data bank uh, and moved on, uh, the data fort rather, and moved on to the architect phase. Now this is the creation phase. This is where they take all of that research and start turning it into something meaningful. So John and I developed uh, a, a, basically a spec catalog with 20 different types of artifacts that the students could produce. Um, and I'll go through one uh, row of what that would look like. So this one is for a mini presentation that they'd have to do in front of the class. First thing we do is we give them a description. This is what you have to do for this mini presentation. Possible topics related to privacy, surveillance, and online security that they could address in their presentation. Uh, examples, online examples of best practice, best examples so they could look and see, oh, that's what a great mini presentation looks like. Suggested tools that they might use to develop their mini presentation. And a rubric. You'll note this rubric is only top level. It doesn't have that level one, level two level. It goes right to the best. This is the best that you can do, and this is what we want from you. And finally, 20 BC. These aren't grades. This is money. They're getting bitcoins for their artifacts. They're not getting grades. They're getting paid. And every artifact has a different value. And to ascend to the next level, to the operative level, you have to earn 40 bitcoins. And we'll explain how those come into play later. So um, what we did then is uh, we set up an accept or reject system for the artifacts. When they'd finish an artifact, they send it to us. If they fulfilled all of these rubric requirements, it's accepted, cha-ching, you get your 20 bitcoins. If it does not meet the requirements, it is sent back to the individual, and they have to fix it up until it does meet the requirements, and then it gets sent to us. So what are they doing? Mastery. They're not stopping until they get it done right, which is more of a real world situation. And then, of course, like the real world, you get paid for a job well done. Um, so this is, these are some of the results. Uh, the one on the left here is an infographic that they designed on hacking. 
This is a fact sheet on drones. Uh, and these are one of, you know, 70 or 80 artifacts that were created. And we picked some good ones, but they were all pretty high level. This is a brochure on companies that track you. This is an info sheet on how Facebook tracks you and gains data. This is just a, a good piece of propaganda to remind people that you are being watched. Um, and this is one of many videos. They had several video options. They could write video essays. Uh, this is a public service announcement that one of the kids made. The 2013 Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey says that 15% of high school kids are being cyberbullied. Kids who are being cyberbullied are often bullied in person as well. Additionally, kids who are cyberbullied have a harder time getting away from this behavior because it can occur 24 7. Cyberbullying can lead to lower self esteem, depression, and in some cases, even suicide. Speak up about cyberbullying. Save a life. So, one thing we found really important about these artifacts is we feel very strongly that more people should be aware about the whole cyber world because they're not. So, we made all of these artifacts with keeping in mind that they could be displayed publicly and therefore inform the community. So, these posters went up on the school wall, these videos were played in, in, in public video sites. So, that way, we're actually helping the community and, and, and generating awareness within the community and not just within the classroom. So once they created enough artifacts to generate 40 bitcoins, they ascended to the operative rank. And this is where all of a sudden they find a catch of documents and there are a dozen or more profiles of these other people. Who are these people? Oh my God, there's been another team this whole time going through all of these ranks like we have and now we've been tasked to find out who they are and where they are. And my students of course thought, it's another class in the school. It's the school down the street. They never thought that it was in another country, which really kind of set up an interesting uh, set of circumstances after this. So what we did is for the operative or for the operative phase is we were inspired by this little beautiful catalog, which you can find online. This was part of the NSA leaks that Mr. Snowden put out into the world. And this is a really creepy catalog where people in the NSA can buy all these James Bonds type gadgets to spy on you in any number of ways, right? And you should go through it. They all have really nice names like Rage Master. Um, so we modeled our catalog exactly like the NSA's catalog. And we gave them 20 protocols or 25 protocols. And these are ways to open up little windows into the world of your opponent. So you would launch a protocol which you would pay for with those Bitcoins. You'd shop in the catalog based on those Bitcoins. And then these protocols would lead you to your opponent. They all had a, a title and serial number. Uh, an inspiring image, a description, cost, and all the basic information. And it was all laid out in this kind of 25-page document. So how did they get caught, right? This is the fun part. Well, one of them... Okay, so right, exactly. So narratively what happens is that because they have these nano chips implanted in their heads, what you are doing with a protocol is hijacking a person. You're hacking a person by hacking their chip and forcing them to carry out a certain event or a certain task in their side of the game. And if you didn't do it, you were very heavily penalized. So everybody carried out their protocols in due time. So one of the first protocols launched by John School on mine was the street sign protocol. This forces an individual that within 24 hours, you have to take a picture of a street sign that's within one mile of your institution, right? So my guys, thinking that it was a local game, went to another high school within the one mile yes, took a street sign, uh, the picture of a street sign in front of Harvard Collegiate Institute, thinking they're going to think we're at Harvard Collegiate. We're tricking them. Well, this failed miserably because as it turns out, there is only one Harvard Street in all of North America, and it's in <laughs> Toronto. And as a result, all they had to do was Google search Harvard Street, and they nailed it. These guys are in Toronto. So how did they finish the job? This is also really funny. They sent out a drone. They launched the drone protocol, and the drone protocol took an image of a bird's eye view of the school, which they then matched with a Google map within one mile of that street sign. So check it out. So they got this image. There were no descriptions or street names, but all you had to do is look on Google Maps within a mile of that sign, and all of a sudden the buildings fit a certain pattern, Royal St. George's College, and the Canadians lost. So, uh, but we, don't, we didn't announce if they were right or wrong until the game was completely over so that nobody was discouraged to stop playing until after it was over. So then we caught them two days later. 
because they sent out a screenshot protocol which forces your opponent to take a screenshot of their desktop in a very limited amount of time and send it back. Most guys who had this protocol launched cleaned their, their, their desktops of any information. Unfortunately, this individual left his last name on one document and his first name on another document. I guys put it together and did a Facebook search on an open Facebook page where sure enough he is proudly showing his school uniform and colors on his Facebook site. And my guys immediately, and there was a situation where they ran and called his school in Connecticut to ask for him, which raised a few alarms at John's school. And I had to write, write John and say, John, go tell your secretary that there, we, we, you know, there, he's not being hunted down by a terrorist or anything like that. <laughs> so it was kind of a, a scary situation. But anyway, so they figured, and again, this is showing them how the way they present themselves online makes them vulnerable, right? They're living this reality. Um, so what did the students think? John. So we uh, definitely wanted to find out uh, a lot of feedback uh, about how would this work from an online perspective from their perception. And uh, unfortunately, we were pretty encouraged by, by what we found. So we sent out an anonymous survey to all the questions. Um, and one of the things we were looking for was, OK, engagement. Was this operating the way we wanted to and pulling them in uh, as, as games can do? And uh, then we selected one quote from the YouTube, but this was fairly representative of, of, of the general uh, uh, feeling. It said, this game made me look forward <coughs> to my class. Now, it's, uh, you know, so this is, is drawing them in. They are not being forced to do this. They want to be there. Critical thinking. Is this getting them? Is this challenging them intellectually the way that we want it to? I learned more about hackers who make the infographic. I also definitely own the critical thinking skills. So they're very aware of what is making this do. So we're feeling even better. Choice. Now this was surprising. We had built in a lot of choice with all those different artifacts that they can mix and match however they want on any topic that they want within this very broad umbrella of, of cybersecurity and surveillance. They really like having agency and choice over what they could do. I felt as if being able to choose the type of artifact I wanted let me learn in a way I found interesting, making me more interested in learning. Giving students choice and agency has a profound effect on their ability and their engagement. Learning. Was it, were they actually learning anything? Where were we seeing kind of content and skills knowledge being developed? I learned a lot about cybersecurity. I also learned a lot about iMovie. I discovered that I like to have very skilled at using iMovie, something I did not know before. So we're getting content knowledge and skills knowledge. 21st century skill of knowledge, like video editing. So, um, actually, we're not just this for a long time, but kids like getting outside of the classroom. And, and give them a chance to get up and get around. They will very much appreciate it. So, this was a very important uh, and a fairly nerve wracking question. Sure, we think it's cool, it's a lot of fun, but is there value added here? Are we actually getting better than what the normal traditional uh, you know, kind of delivery system would be getting at. Here's what they said. 86% of them reported that they learned as much or more than a traditional unit in our classes. So this was almost everybody, which is really best case scenario. You're not going to get 100% ever. So it did leave about 14% of guys who reported, ah, I felt I learned a little bit less. This wasn't ideal for me. This was not something that I was designed for my own time. But Pretty encouraging results, especially when you look at this. 50% of them, half of the boys in all classes, reported that they learned more or much more than a traditional unit in our classes. So we're seeing, uh, for us, that's paying dividends, and that's kind of the results that we were hoping to see. So, Paulson is going to begin to wrap up here, going to kind of point out a few things that, okay, if you're interested in ARGs, interested in building your own, here are some of the kind of the building blocks. Here's some of the important uh, aspects to look at uh, when you want to put yours together. Okay, so we're running out of time, so I'll go fairly quickly. But the whole thing is, we don't we don't want you to take blind protocol and try to adjust it to your class. We're here to play Lego. I'm going to break it down to all its little bricks, and you guys should build it to your comfort level because you have different schools, different technology, different worlds. Uh, it's, it's all different for every one of us, and I feel these types of games have to be catered to your individual environment. So the first thing that creates immersion is story and narrative. All of our games use stories or narratives in the background. And they don't have to be complicated stories, but there are advantages. One, storytelling is as almost as old as humanity. It's our way of ordering the universe. It's an important component for engagement. Secondly, 
stories create emotional connections and emotional connections is what allows us to remember most of what you remember from high school has an emotional basis from it or basis to it uh, so stories are great ways to deliver emotion and to structure the story and to create engagement uh, next we have repurposing your space increasingly we can change the nature of space pretending the school is an asylum and as augmented reality and qr codes and all of these uh, items allow us uh, allow us to pr to place digital information in our environment and change the nature of our environment based on accessing that digital information. Fake documents and false documents. Uh, we created all kinds of false documents that looked very realistic. We can do this in the digital age. There's all kinds of generators and tools online that allow you to make everything from fake uh, ID cards to diplomas to whatever the case may be. And you can use these to create this, this blur between reality and fiction. And you can use so social media is great. Facebook allows you to create fictional character pages. Twitter allows you to do whatever you want. You can put stuff on Instagram. This is their ecology, their world, and we can immerse them. We can draw them in by using social media. Collaborators, people in your environment that can be part of the game. People like John's history teacher with the Masonic symbol, a few of my colleagues that played doctors at various points in the ward game, our IT directors who played characters in Blind Protocol, but also helped us set up all kinds of fake email accounts and to create that, those, those non-playing characters that only contact our students via, e uh, via email, which allows us to have multiple characters even though there's only a few of us running the game. So your role, you have three options. You can be the puppet master, much like John was in Dolus, where you, well, I don't know what's going on, but you're behind the scenes running the whole thing like the Wizard of Oz. The next is the diva, where you are very much a part of the game. You're, you're present, you're consciously running the game, you very much accept your role within the game. And then the halfway point, which we call the pawn, which was the roles we assumed during Blind Protocol, where we were also henchmen for Horace because he planted a chip in our heads. So we didn't really know where it was all going, but we were actually working with the students to help them through the program. Now, these are game mechanics. If you are going to design your own game, if you're going to do this or try this, just do a Google search on game mechanics. And you're going to get all kinds of lists of mechanics which make games games, like moving a piece on a board, like uh, you know currency, rolling dice, jumping in a video game, timers, or moving around a Rubik's Cube. These are all the elements that make games games. And you can strip mine those and implement them into your practice. Never mind if you're not even running a game. If you want to make your lesson more interesting, look at the game mechanics that have been proven to engage students and use them as part of your practice. And one of the best are quests and missions. Quests and missions are great ways for kids to do work, and they love to do work in this way because it differentiates, they can choose what quests, there's a variety of options, they have choices within the system, and they have autonomy. And the only problem with this system that's been reported by anybody who's used it, the kids finish the work way too fast. They blow through your unit, and all of a sudden you've got two weeks left and you don't know what to do with this kid that's done everything that could possibly be done, which is a really good problem to have. Uh, and John is going to talk a little bit about puzzles and finish up. So, Thank you. Uh, very quickly, so puzzles are all running the game. And puzzles are the kind of the bread and butter of how you work your way through an alternate reality. And we saw a few examples of, of the riddles and challenges they were going through. But uh, a really nice kind of foundational workplace is that many alternate reality games use codes and ciphers because they, they act like almost like a locked door as, as you want them to find a way through. Uh, and what's important is, is when you use codes and ciphers, you're going to shortcut a very uh, bad problem to have, which is if you have a puzzle set up where the student picks the right answer but doesn't know it, that's, then that's game over. And if they look back and like, I got the answer five hours ago, and they stop them out. So the codes and ciphers, well, once they get the right uh, thing, and they will, they will bang their head against the wall for I had a student who literally said, uh, I was up till uh, 4 o'clock this morning trying to figure this out, but I got it. Uh, they, will, they, will, they will sweat. But they have to know when they get the right answer right away. And codes and ciphers usually do that because as soon as they figure out the right trick to it, it begins to be code itself either in whole or in part. And they're, they're completely fine. And that way, they're doing research to figure out this puzzle, not just randomly guessing how these weird uh, things work. So existing codes and ciphers, just Google it, you will find websites and apps on your phone that have all of the codes and ciphers. <laughs> All mm -hmm. delivered right there for you. You just pick and choose, and it's very easy to figure out. Uh, so, so stick to these because they're the bread and butter for a reason because they work. Oh, and I should mention this article is really great. Adam Foster, Alternate Reality Game uh, uh, Puzzle Design. 
in ARG for Portal 2, and he really breaks down the logic of the source for problems. So if you're interested in puzzles, it's a great four page article. Uh, that's a, it's a great starting point. All right, so what about curriculum? You might, you might be asking yourself, all right, keywords, I've got curriculum that I've got to work with. Uh, does this ARG work? Well, hopefully, we've convinced you that you can design an ARG around any learning outcome that you want if you are customizing it from the ground up. For example, here's the, uh, the NCT, the National Coalition of Teachers of English, I believe. Uh, Council? Council. Uh, 21st century literacy. Take a look at that list. Blind Protocol hits every single one. And we didn't even mean to do that. Because <laughs> games are for these guys, games like this are for these guys to be 21st century learners, independent, autonomous, and collaborative. It's baked in. It is what games are. Games are 21st century learners. So don't be afraid that you can't do curriculum because you can in there just because you have to design it from the ground up. So some final thoughts. Use your students. Because they will help you, as Paul mentioned. They will give immediate feedback saying, mm, you should probably tweak this because uh, it didn't really work that well. And they'll do it positively. Use online resources. If you're like, hey, I need to make X, Google for it. You can probably find something online that will allow you to make X. You know, uh, Mozilla's WebMaker uh, allows you to, to, to take a website and then customize it to say whatever you want so it appears real. And all you have to do is just save that as a PDF, and boom, you've got that fake article. I think it looks exactly real. Take risks, experiment. Teachers, and myself included, we have this feeling that we can't experiment. If we screw up, it's game over. Every lesson has to be perfect, right? No. A, a lesson that has quirks and it didn't work 100% may, in some cases, be a better learning experience because the students saw the process. They saw what they're doing, what the learning uh, is making them do, and making them not do. And they, they think and they reflect about it. Don't be afraid to experiment. Find what excites you. Paul and I look at the novels that we like, look at the topics of online cybersecurity that we are passionate about, and we went after that. Go after what excites you and customize it to your environment. You know what works in your classroom, you know what works in your school, you know what works for your students. Go there first. And then uh, play games. This was mentioned this morning by Peggy. Play games. You need to get you know, those calories in your body to find more ideas about what you can break down and use in your own game. My, the list came directly from me playing an MMO that used ARG mechanics and the light bulb went off. And I was immediately just started building a <coughs> map. Start small. Do a, a, a one day ARG. Do a one hour ARG. Now start small and you see how it works and build from there. And then uh, finally, easy way to do it, run as a club. Lose extra credit. Low risk, but you will, you will definitely see some very high engagement that can give you some confidence to build on later. So, Paul and I are huge super nerds. We love you're you're a bigger nerd than I am, John. <laughs> uh, so, come find us, come talk to us, email us, tweet at us. We will talk about ARGs and all kinds of nerdy stuff uh, you know, all day and all night. Uh, so, hopefully, we give you some ideas and uh, hopefully, um, you're starting to do a little bit of uh, hacking in your own classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Huh. I, I think over, but are there any questions at all? Anything? Everybody's hungry. Yep, Mitch. So, what should run a game like this once? Well, we have to make adjustments because the schools have been revealed. So, this game in particular, Blind Protocol in particular, and we've thought about how to do it, how to make those adjustments, but in a beautiful world, we would get it to a point that it would actually be fairly easy for teachers to run, and then they would never know what school we're playing is. We have five or 10 teachers who are in the pool who really want to play this and feel connected to it, then we can start using all of these schools as part of it. But yeah, any of the other games that we talked about, we run every year as it is, and they work beautifully. Thank you. <laughs>